Yeah. All right, fantastic. All right, welcome to uh, our uh, uh, webinar today, our series of webinars. Um, so um, uh, today, during today's webinar, uh, we will be talking, uh, we'll be sharing with you uh, on how we have designed, built, uh, and deployed uh, a chatbot uh, in the cloud uh, within three weeks. Um, so uh, let's start uh, by um, uh, by uh, sharing with you uh, what uh, are the objectives and what you are going to get out of this webinar. Uh, you will get an understanding on the, the planning uh, and also on the uh, uh, technology we have used. Uh, and eventually, uh, we also will dive uh, into uh, into how we have done it. Okay. Um, so these uh, these uh, are in a nutshell what are the objectives uh, on the, of the de of this webinar uh, today. Um, uh, regarding today, uh, as speakers, we have uh, uh, Tiffany uh, Tiffany Kuo is a software engineer uh, here at Roque Hong Kong. Hi, Tiffany. Hi, everyone. Uh, then we have uh, also Dominic Morgan, a uh, software engineer and data scientist uh, at uh, Zolke. Hello, guys. Hi, Dom. Hi. And then we have uh, uh, Luca Kakiani. Uh, Luca is a business solution manager here at Zolke Hong Kong. Hi, Luca. Hello. Uh, and then myself, Antonio Tinto. I'm a business development manager here at uh, Zolke Hong Kong. Um, so uh, let's run to the agenda of today. Uh, we will have uh, uh, an overview, a first section overview, uh, where uh, Luke and I will go through some uh, um, uh, fast facts and also uh, with the planning of the chatbot. Uh, then the other session will be covered by Tiffany uh, on the technology and the architecture we have used to build the chatbot. Uh, and then uh, Dom uh, will dive into how we build and design the chatbot. Uh, we will be closing the session of, the ta to, of today uh, with a, a Q&A. Um, so uh, before we kick off, so I want to say, I want to share a story. So how we did come up with this, uh, uh, with this uh, chatbot webinar. Uh, let's take a step back. So uh, let's cover, so, what is in principle what we do at Zilke first, right? So Zilke, um, at Zilke, basically, uh, we help our clients to uh, uh, to build uh, bespoke software solutions, um, and uh, so we we like essentially to really solve a complex problem. So in this specific case, uh, one of our clients came to us with a, with a problem, and the problem was that they wanted to uh, uh, to show uh, to show basically data uh, data points uh, to their clients uh, in a simple manner, uh, in a quick manner, and simple manner, and not only the data points but also uh, reports. Um, therefore, what I did, we, I, I reached out to Luca, and um, which is on the call today, and. Uh, Luca, do you want to share uh, what kind of solutions you, how did you come up with the solutions and what you provided to the, to the clients? Cool, uh, thanks Antonio. So you're right, uh, effectively the issue was that uh, we, had, our clients had a hundred of reports to manage. Uh, there was uh, an intrinsic data complexity in uh, uh, what, um, what the business is about. And uh, uh, of all these hundred reports and data, uh, managers of, uh, uh, of our clients wanted to uh, access a specific information of their business. So um, we did a brainstorm in the session. Uh, we're thinking, oh, how can we help uh, uh, this client to, to get the information that they really want in uh, no time? And, uh, and then we came up with the idea of creating a chatbot for them. Ah, thanks, Luca. So yeah, chatbot. So uh, um, why the chatbot? If you see today, uh, the expert basically uh, predicts that 90% of customer interaction in, in the bank so will be uh, automated in the 2020. We already seen this in the market happening. Uh, so automation is one of the uh, uh, trendy topics. Uh, and uh, uh, up to 72% of actually healthcare uh, admin task um, could be automated by artificial intelligence. Uh, and the adoption of the, of the chatbots uh, uh, could save uh, actually uh, by various industries like healthcare, banking, and retail sector over 11 billion annually uh, by 2023. This is according to Business, business Insider. Um, 
so what are the what are the actual use cases of the chatbots? We put together a list here, as you can see on my screen, uh, of some of the uh, uh, use case, typical use cases of uh, uh, of using a chatbot. So, so one of them is uh, the most popular one is uh, getting a quick answer in an emergency, uh, resolving a complaint or a problem. So we see this actually in uh, uh, within customer care, uh, and getting detailed answers or explanations. Uh, and then uh, uh, finding uh, a human customer service assistant. Um, so these are just for, for the more most popular. Uh, what, uh, what I also want to share with you that, uh, so the successful chatbot are able to drive a, a good conversational experience uh, that mimics humans, a human agent effectively. So uh, to give an example of, uh, of uh, chatbots we actually have on the market, uh, similar uh, experiences, uh, we have uh, Alexa, for instance, from, uh, from, uh, from Amazon, and uh, also Apple has got like Siri as a product, and also eventually uh, Google. Uh, they offer solutions that have a, they will give a great conversational experience. Um, okay, so just a second, let me see this pool here coming up for the moment. Uh, so, Say that uh, I think, uh, Luca. Why don't you show us a little bit more? What, what, what the kind of our chat? What, what does it do? What kind of? What are the functionalities? Sure. Let me, right, guys. Let me know when you can see the. Um, yep. Uh, the screen with we the can chat see button. it. Fantastic. All right. So um, let me go through this chatbot and uh, tell you a bit more about the features. So as soon as I uh, click on uh, start chatting, the chatbot will come up and uh, will start asking questions. Now, uh, this chatbot uh, um, has been developed uh, with uh, several features, like uh, showing uh, some uh, answering some uh, frequently asked questions. So let's put one, for example. So what are the symptoms of COVID? Uh, as you can see here, uh, the chatbot uh, uh, replies to uh, some questions uh, that can be um, of general interest uh, in terms of uh, uh, COVID-19. And also uh, gives you uh, some information in terms of uh, number of cases uh, in uh, uh, several countries, uh, uh, number of people that recovered, the number of people that passed away. So Antonio, have you got like a country in mind that you can uh, tell me and I'll uh, uh, tell uh, you the number of people that recovered? Maybe Australia. Okay. How many people There we are. So uh, uh, as you can see here, the chatbot uh, uh, quickly replies we, with a uh, uh, number of people uh, that um, recorded in Australia. And uh, the data is uh, it's pretty accurate. Uh, uh, it's taken from uh, the uh, John Hopkins University data source and uh, is up to date uh, in terms of yeah. Can we also see Hong Kong, Luca? Of course. Let's, let's, All right. Let's so so let's Kong. see how many people, many people recovered in Hong Kong. All right. Wow. So 787 as of uh, uh, yesterday, 27th of April. But also, I can actually show you uh, a plot if you want to. Okay. So show me that plot. There we are. That's pretty nice. I mean, uh, it shows basically the uh, the plot of uh, number of people uh, in this case that um, were uh, confirmed or recovered or passed away in Hong Kong uh, across the uh, the old duration of the COVID nineteen. Um, again. We kind of covered uh, uh, all the countries uh, in the world uh, and uh, uh, I believe also all the uh, uh, provinces in China. So uh, uh, it's kind of comprehensive uh, uh, bot that gives information uh, across mm -hmm. all over the world. Hi. Thanks. So, so Luca, yeah. how did you go through the planning process of uh, this, uh, 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 coming up with this, uh, uh, the chatbot? Yeah, right. So um, how we did this? We um, we took a uh, agile approach, uh, specifically Kanban, for uh, uh, for building this chatbot in uh, uh, in just three weeks. And uh, uh, the way we approached this project was by um, having a, a strong cohesive team of uh, uh, four people, so uh, four engineers, uh, all based in uh, here in Hong Kong, 
and uh, work close with our clients uh, to understand uh, all the priorities uh, and uh, uh, all the features that we want to, uh, to push to this chatbot. Um, we used uh, uh, Kanban in order to create an incremental um, uh, solution for our clients. And we had some review points, so like uh, every uh, two or three days, um, I'm on the team, uh, myself, uh, Ian, Tanya, the clients, uh, again, to make sure that uh, whatever feature we pushed to this uh, um, to this chatbot was uh, uh, well agreed with uh, with our clients, uh, and we could actually have a effective solution that could provide value within uh, um, within just three weeks. I mean, the idea behind uh, of this uh, COVID nineteen chatbot was that we wanted to sh to create a walking skeleton to show how um, uh, data flow. Uh, from uh, uh, very, um, from the external data sources. In this case, we took uh, the uh, John Hopkins University uh, data source down to uh, the reports and uh, the display of reports uh, through a chatbot, but passing through a Google Cloud platform. So a um, an Azure solution that could uh, uh, aggregate the data in the cloud, and uh, uh, once the data are aggregated, it can split the data and uh, um, make this data available to uh, to the uh, the um, uh, to our clients. We used uh, uh, pair programming at least at the very beginning. Um, with this team uh, of four, we're um, using again the pair programming uh, uh, up until I believe the first week. And then we had this whole situation of being working from home. So uh, we had to kind of cut down, uh, unfortunately, the communication. It was a bit difficult to work in pair programming at that stage uh, while working from home. So we decided that uh, every person in the team could actually pick up a feature. Mm -hmm. We uh, we used the principles uh, as a continuous integration, continuous development. Uh, specifically uh, in order to uh, ensure that uh, uh, four people could work at the same time without uh, stepping their foot and uh, uh, ensure that uh, the quality of the solution that we're uh, providing was uh, up to the top uh, for our client. Right, so uh, with this in mind, uh, I'll pass the floor back to you, Antonio. A quick question for you, Luca, sure. is, uh, so what, what is uh, one of the key challenges you had to face while you go through this process? Well, uh, one of the key challenges uh, was to ensure that we could actually provide uh, good value um, to our client within three weeks. So uh, uh, the challenge was to define uh, uh, very well the priorities uh, of the features that we wanted to put in this, uh, in this solution and make sure that the client uh, uh, was happy with uh, uh, all these uh, features that we were developing. Again, in three weeks, uh, you can't deliver much, right? So you need to make right. uh, uh, bold decisions in terms of uh, what features you want to, uh, to develop. Thank you. Thanks, Luca. Uh, great. So uh, we'll uh, then we we'll move on to next uh, to next uh, session. Uh, we'll be covering now the technology uh, and the architecture. Uh, Tiffany, uh, I think over to you. Are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Let me share okay. my. Screen. Great. You're in the same office like me. <laughs> Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yep. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to meet you here in webinar about chatbot built by Zoki. I'm Tiffany. I'm going to cover the technical stacks to build this coronavirus chatbot. Before I start, I'd like to touch a bit about the increasingly significant presence of chatbot in our daily lives. As Antonio and Luca already mentioned, with the help of machine learning and artificial intelligence, chatbots can do more for us and for the business. Chatbot can leverage the data we provide to it, chat with people intelligently in a specific area of topic. Like what Zoki built here is a coronavirus chatbot that can answer questions smartly about the virus statistics around the world. Okay, without further ado, let's get started. Structure-wise, the chatbot is divided into front-end and back-end. For the front-end side, here are the frameworks we used. Telegram, which is integrated well into the chatbot, 
so we can chat with Telegram as an alternative to web browser. React, which is used to build the front-end site that's reactive and has fast loading and rendering. Also, we use TypeScript for the mobile UX, Mob acts as state management library, and use Vegalite to draw the statistic model. For the backend side, it's running as microservices on the Google Cloud platform. We rely on Kubernetes to manage the lifecycle, scaling, high availability of the microservices. Each microservice makes use of certain frameworks to take care of one aspect of business logic within the chatbot. Specifically, we use Flask Python framework to build the web service. We use GraphQL as query mechanism to fetch the coronavirus statistics from the database. We use Postgres to store the data. We use Apache Beam to create data processing pipeline to pre-process the data. And we use Quarkus to build the container native Java application that has fast startup time and low memory, memory utilization. Moving on, Let's see the high level flow of coronavirus chatbot. Tiffany, just a quick short question for you right before you sure. move on to the, to the architecture. So just if you had to summarize all these uh, uh, for front end and back end, what will be uh, the, the programming languages needed? I, I heard you mean, me, me, <coughs> uh, mentioning Python with Flask with the microservices. What will be the other ones? Mm, actually for the, the front end side, we use the JavaScript mm -hmm. language, and for the backend side is Polyglot. We use many languages for different microservices, like we use the Java for the uh, paired with the Quarkus for report microservice. We mm -hmm. use the Python we, uh, backed by this Flask framework yep. for the web service, and we use the Kotlin for the fulfillment microservice. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, let's look at the the flow. Uh, this flow is very simplified and intuitive. Start from the left hand side. A user initiates a chat with the chatbot, typing his first question into the chat box. Then the chatbot figures out the user intent based on that question, then calls report API on the back end side to get the answer from the database. Now, let's dive deeper into how exactly the chapel works. I'm gonna present this in three parts. First of all is how we get the COVID-19 data and what the data source is. Well, the acquisition of Corona statistics is automated by Google Cloud Scheduler. It's triggered daily. As a result, the PubSub publishes an event to the data intake component. This Python component is to fetch Corona statistics from the data source. The data source is credited to Johns Hopkins University, who maintains the data in CSV format in GitHub, and uploads the new data on a daily basis. Once the data intake component has retrieved the new data, it pushes the data to the cloud storage on GCP. Second point is how we transform the raw data and persist it into storage. This is done by data process microservice powered by Apache Beam. Basically, the microservice periodically checks pending CSV file on the cloud storage to which the data intake component will push the new data, as we mentioned earlier. Then it validates and transforms data. Finally, persists the data in Postgres database. In terms of why we use Apache Beam to handle the data processing, as Antonio and Luca mentioned before, the client needs to process lots of data and reports from different sources. Apache Beam is capable of this. 
it can implement batch and upstreaming data processing jobs that can run on any execution engine simultaneously. Plus, it's unified, portable, and highly extensible. Tiffany, we have uh, actually, I want to hold it for a second. So we have a question for the, from the audience, I guess it's on the previous slide, is uh, what is a POV? POV, oh, sorry, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, and maybe I should check with the Carl. Sorry, I'm not sure this term. Okay. Yeah, I will get back to you later on this. It's my PowerPoint on body. Okay, good. So let's go on. Um, okay, so until now, I believe you've got a better idea about the chatbot. Let's go to the third part, which is about how chatbot talks to the user. Let's walk through the flow step by step. When the user talks to the chatbot, the question is passed from the web service front end to the web service back end. Then comes the most important and core step in the chatbot is that the web service back end hits the dialog flow to get the answer. And we've got two scenarios here. If this is the static question, then the dialog flow just replies back with the static answer, which is pre-configured. My coworker, Tom, will talk more about this shortly. But if this is the dynamic question, which in our case is asking the corona statistics for a certain country, for example, apparently the dialogue flow cannot handle this question. Instead, it triggers web hook, web hook and route the question and the intent to the fulfillment microservice. What this fulfillment microservice does is based on the intent sending GraphQL uh, query to the report microservice. The report microservice is taking care of running the GraphQL engine and handle the database related tasks. Finally, the three parts are put together, making up the whole solution architecture for coronavirus chatbot as we see here. On the left hand side, Google Stack Driver takes care of the admin related tasks such as locking, monitoring, and alert. So yes, this is the, the main part of the solution. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, just a quick question for you as I asked for Luke. So what, what, what was, uh, can you highlight one of the key challenges of uh, building this technical solution? Sure. Thanks. And I think the tight schedule is the, the biggest challenge for, for us to do this chatbot. Yeah, so we should um, should handle the, the, the whole architecture. And meanwhile, we should make sure that our CICD pipeline is set up well and we can automatically uh, adjust to any new requirements and changing conditions. So uh, for that, I would say uh, we should have uh, full, fully built CI/CD pipeline in the first day, and so that okay. the, yes, the changes. Uh, thank you, thank you, Tiffany. Uh, so I don't. Uh, so you ready to go ahead and share your screen? Yeah, just one moment. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about what it was like to use Dialogflow um, and give you a little demo of the UI, so you can get a sense of uh, what it's like to use. Uh, just a quick comment, I built a chatbot maybe around a year ago and I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised by how the technology's matured. Um, this time around it was considerably easier um, and I think that's largely because of using Dialogflow because uh, it has a lot of features built in uh, as I will show you. So um, I'm going to start with talking about training and uh, the best way to do this is going to be if I just pop to the Google console over here. So this right now, what you can see is what the training UI looks like. So you can see it's quite fleshed out. So let's start with uh, how you would add an intent. So we've got like simple ones, like maybe to get the bot's name. So um, you just add training phrases here in the UI. And after you've added a small amount, um, it will be able to recognize these phrases. Uh, what's nice as well is that you can test them directly here as well. So, so what is your name? 
uh, to double check that it is picking up what you're putting in. And then you can see our response. Uh, if I scroll down a little bit more, uh, so like we mentioned before, you can integrate with different platforms. And what's particularly cool is you can customize the responses for different platforms. So maybe on Telegram, you'd want to have a different response. Oh, this feature is only available if you use the web app. You can put this here. So it's like a channel for it as a sort of by channels, right? Yeah, by channel. So you can customize the response by channel. Um, okay, so maybe a slightly more complicated phrase. So Tiffany was mentioning earlier that you've got two types of, uh, you can break the intents into two types. Some of them are just static, like what is the bot's name? You're just going to return some text. Whereas others, you may want to fetch some additional data, like um, the coronavirus statistics. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it's, it's slightly more complicated because we, we have to figure out what statistic they would like to fetch. Okay. Uh, so you can see this is this parameter here. And then you also need to pick up with respect to what location. So, so Dom, it's, a, it's very interesting just to, all about, uh, to ask a quick question. So is there available uh, like templates so that you can speed up your work? Yeah, so... Um, you have to build everything yourself. Here, um, I'm, let's click here. So you can see that uh, actually it comes with a lot of uh, built-in templates. So you can okay. from here. And um, another thing that's nice is if we go back to this, so it gets that count. So maybe you want to pick up location or you want to pick up date. Um, a lot of these are already built in, so you don't have to you don't have to teach it how to recognize locations, for example, it already knows. Okay, see. Um, but maybe something specific like, uh, in this case, uh, what statistic you wanted, we had to make this entity. I see. Um, all right, so then this is uh, what we're, the data that we're going to get from, from that response. So we can see that we've got the stats type, we've got a country, and we have a, uh, a province. So the only one that's required is what type of statistic you would like. And then we can prompt the user here for the additional information if it's required. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can start to build up quite um, complicated uh, conversational flows and you can do it all through the UI. Uh, this is kind of a blessing and a curse because once you start to get to a large number of uh, phrases, yeah. um, it can be difficult to manage. So you would like to do it in code. But um, unfortunately, the, the libraries are still a little bit beta. Uh, so uh, the documentation is a little bit sparse, but on the upside, they are available in quite a few different languages. So I think Python, Node, and Java. So I'm sure in a few months, um, it'll be much easier to do it uh, by code. Okay, so uh, I hope you guys have got a sense for what it's like to use uh, that UI. Uh, so that was training. And here, I just wanted to iterate again. You can test um, directly through the UI. Um, testing testing your your um, chatbot prog programmatically is quite difficult actually because you can have some variation in the responses. Um, yeah. So, okay. Um, just briefly, strengths and weaknesses. Um, I think it handles uh, small talk and has built-in conversations already which is really nice and you can get started with very little training examples like maybe even 10 is good enough um, and there's enough flexibility in the platform to uh, start to build quite complicated conversational flows and integration with other uh, channels like slack or telegram is very good and built in out of the box um, a bit on the weaknesses so like I mentioned, the client libraries are still a little bit beta, so you may want to, uh, they, they need a little bit of time to develop, I believe. And sometimes the responses do vary. For example, on occasion, Hong Kong was picked up as a country, whereas other times it was picked up as a province. Um, so you might have to special case this on your back end. Um, 
Yeah. And then the UI was, I, the UI that I've showed you is directly related to the back end code. So maybe you have a manager and they want to change the text. Um, just small thing, maybe there's a typo. It might not necessarily be the best idea to give them access to that, that console, uh, just because changes there could break the, the chatbot in production. And you're only allowed a single agent per GCP project. Um, okay, and then just a little bit on conversational design. So this is kind of like, I think it's a, it's a bigger field than, than I realized when I started the project. Um, and it's quite difficult to get, get the conversational flow right. Uh, the first time you do it, it probably won't be right. And you need to test it and show it to a lot of people. Uh, the trouble of being a developer working on this is you kind of get, um, I'm not quite sure what the phrase is, but because you're looking at it every single day, you know exactly what the chatbot's going to say. So you, you need fresh eyes to come and look at your conversation and check if it makes sense. And um, to, to do this for multiple languages as well would, it's possible, but you would require a native language speaker and the conversational flow might differ amongst different languages. So this would require some thought. So, uh, uh, Dom, I have a question for you. So if, if I had, you know, being, let's say, the CTO or CIO, and I would love to hire this, you know, wanted to hire someone to build this uh, chatbot, uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, skills I would like to look out for and uh, uh, what actually are, could be transferable skill set to, uh, uh, to, uh, to build a chatbot? Um, so I think what, uh, a full stack engineer, and depending on whether you wanted to uh, develop your own UI for it or integrate with one of the other channels, uh, that full stack engineer would need to be, if you want to make your own UI, you have to be quite good at front end, of course. But if you integrate with one of the channels, mm -hmm. then uh, good back end knowledge is sufficient. And then for the conversational design, I think uh, UX skills are very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. So what would they come up uh, come out of with the UX uh, skill set? Pardon? Which which part will help uh, of most, the development? Mostly in the in the design of the conversation, like what you're gonna okay. say, because actually if you design a conversation in the correct way, um, you can prompt users for data and it kind of simplifies the logic on the back end a little bit. But it's okay. not it's hard to explicitly um, do this because you do, you just do it naturally as a human. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, interesting. Uh, great, thanks, Dom. Uh, I uh, before I move to the Q and A session, uh, I like to uh, ask a question to each one uh, of you. Uh, I'll go with first with Luca. Uh, and um, uh, so my question, Luca, is uh, is uh, what is that you guys uh, uh, had to let's say, what, what, what's your lesson learned for, uh, for uh, building a chapel from, uh, from a planning perspective? Well, in terms of lesson learned, what I would say is uh, make sure you're close with your clients. So ensure that the communication between uh, uh, you and your clients uh, um, is, uh, is always active. That channel uh, communication is always active so that you can uh, test uh, some ideas, uh, test some features, uh, get feedback straight away, and then uh, uh, ensure that you provide at the end of your, uh, uh, your project good value. Thanks, Luca, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Tiffany, uh, what, what's the lesson learned from uh, the technology perspective? Yeah, so for, for, my, um, for my experience, I think since the schedule is very tight, she would better have a, a platform ready for the development and auto uh, deployment. So it's better to have the build and deployment automation ready in, in the day one and always have a system working and we start from the very beginning and we incrementally add functionality to a working system and we see the, the effect changes right away. And finally, I would say having a script in infrastructure automation helps a lot in order to add the new in in functionality to the system and uh, it's better for the documentation. 
so when you when you when you mention about Alps a lot, is is there like Alps in terms of time effectiveness? Uh, uh, sorry. Is there, sorry. Is there, when you mention when you mention the Alps a lot, is there, is there Alps in terms of time? You guys can get things done quicker than it would be actually be done in a normal situation. Uh, yes, and so because yeah. the platform provides the the lock locking monitoring alert, so we. Okay. I focus, focus more on the business logic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Uh, Dom, what about on your side? What's your lesson learned? Um, I think at the start, if I was to do it again, I would spend more time um, developing the conversations on paper and then try to get people, once you've got that in code and working as a chatbot, try to get people speaking to it as soon as possible. So you can start iterating on the, the conversation design sooner because inevitably you always miss something and yeah. that just helps improve the, I think the quality of the, the conversation and getting it sounding more natural quicker. So the quicker you get testing with actual live users, the better it is, right? Yes, so, yes. Even if it's just, you know, everyone in the office or whatever, yeah. the family, something, but uh, get yeah. it. People family can... and friends. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, th thanks a lot, Dom. Uh, I think then this session will move then to the Q&A. Uh, I think we're done for this. Thank you very much. Thank you.